So, as you know, the world is marking 29 years since the writer and activist Ken Sarawiwa and eight of his acolytes were tried by a military tribunal, sentenced to death for incitement and murder, and executed in what many believe was an abominable act of judicial homicide. There are many here in Nigeria and around the world who are absolutely convinced that Mr. Sarawiwa was 100% innocent. And every year, the calls for his total exoneration grow ever louder. But for the relatives of the Ogoni Four who were murdered by a mob they believe was incited by Mr. Sarawiwa, there is a deeper context that is never examined and any mention of their tragic slaughter and the horror of their lynching is often largely ignored, as if their lives didn't matter. They have consistently argued that Ken Sarawiwa, a gifted orator, had publicly denounced the Ogoni Four verbally, as well as in leaflets that were widely distributed, in which he's alleged to have called them ethnic traitors, evil government collaborators and vultures. But well, that's one side of the story. The other side was made persuasively by my guest on this program on Tuesday night, one of Ken Sarawiwa's supporters, the National Coordinator of the Ogoni Solidarity Forum, Celestine Abobari, who insisted that Mr. Sarawiwa was nowhere near the location of the attack and deserved to be fully exonerated and even canonized by the Nigerian government. Take a listen. Clearly, the Ogoni people are still traumatized by Mr. Sarawiwa's death and that of his other activists who were executed with him. Sure, we have not recovered, you know, from 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 that that stately act. We have never recovered, and I, I don't think that uh, Ogoni people will ever recover from that, especially because. Um, this was a conspiracy. Uh, Kesarua was not even anywhere close to where the, the four gun leaders were killed. In fact, um, that place was, was very close to the military base of Paul Kuntumo. So if there is any person to be accused you know, of killing those people, it should be Paul Kuntumo and his men who, who were living next door to where this incident happened. Ken Sarwa was not around, and they know the truth. But I think, it, like I said, it was a conspiracy. They wanted to teach the Ogoni people and other Niger Delta communities a lesson on how not to um, play and toy with um, the heartbeat of the economy, which is oil. Um, in their thinking, they thought that um, after killing Ken Sarwa and the Ogoni people, that uh, the next morning, um, oil will begin to flow. But this is about 33 years after Shell was sacked from Ogoni, and it surprised them that the oil is still under the soil. The oil is yet to flow because there is so much blood on the oil. Unlike um, other oil uh, in other parts of the Niger Delta, the oil in Ogoni has so much blood on it. And to assess the oil, you will need to remove a lot of blood from it. And Nigeria hands and the oil company have soiled with the Ogoni blood so much that. Um, um, oil will refuse to flow, even if they want to do it. And that's Celestina Bobbery there, who's a, a supporter of uh, Ken Sarawiwa and is the national coordinator of the Ogoni Solidarity Forum. And so, to the right to respond. And that right of reply was requested and has been granted to the businessman and former chairman of the AC and ACN in River State, Suage Bade, who is the son of Mr. Albert Bade, one of the Agoni Four, who was lynched by a mob in May 1994. Okay. And Mr. Bade joins me now in the studio. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you, Charles, for having me. Your reaction to what you heard there? Yeah, actually, um, I am rich with pain and I'm going to try my best not to allow the emotions tear me apart. Celestine Apobari is a guy I know so well. I've visited him in his house and severally we have discussed these issues. And it's so sad that he can come on national television to tell lies 
So sad. There is no military base near Gokana. On that day, it was the Constitution, Constitutional Conference elections that were being held, and there were rules. Ken Sarua is from Kana constituency in Ogoni, while we are from Gokana. And he wouldn't take, keep to the rules because he was campaigning, going about promoting the usual propaganda that all the elites in Ogoni were vultures. And so he got into Gokana on that day, and then the police stopped him and said, you're not supposed to be here. Go back. Before you knew it, there was a large crowd around. And he addressed them. My father was in a meeting where they were holding a meeting in Gokana to you know, address the issue of the conflicts that are on and also to um, you know, honor one who had been made a commissioner in the government at that time. And so I said to the young men there, go to Joko in Gokana, that the vultures are there sharing money given to them by Shell and the government. But the truth about it is that they needed that mob to be there. It had been planned. And he was the mastermind. He had the head of the NICOP, which was the militant wing of Mossop, led by Good Luck Debo. Good Luck Debo ran away from River State after the killings, went through Kotonu, through the refugee program, because they are very good at lies. These are people who peddle lies. Now he's in Canada. Maybe one day when he comes in here, we'll have to try him for the murder. And that's the truth. They can't just keep on. We want peace in Ogoni. You can't keep on peddling lies. It's very simple. Be remorseful about what you have done. I was an eyewitness. I was at the scene of this crime. Yes, I'm, I'm curious to hear what you saw, because um, you, you mentioned that you were an eyewitness. I mean, you, you mentioned that to me before you came on air. Um, yes. Tell us what you saw and how you've been dealing with what you saw. It's difficult because it's like 30 years plus now when my father and his friends, Chief Edward Kobani, Chief Samuel Arage, and Chief Teofos Arage were butchered. They were actually butchered. We didn't have their bodies till now. And I was in the house. I had a terrible dream that morning that he was going to die at 5 a.m. So, but I didn't sleep at home. So I quickly rushed. It was a sanitation day, 21st of May, 1994, sanitation day. And so I, I wanted to go, but you can't move. So I waited till 10 a.m. to get to the house. When I got to the house, he had already gone for the meeting. So I just relaxed and I was at home. Then it, it wasn't quite about an hour or so, the driver came and said, ah, our guy is, has been beaten. He's from Akwaibom. One victor. He said, oh, guy is being beaten. I said, what do you mean? It now occurred to me, because my father has been talking to me over time. Saru wants to take my life. He has been telling me. He has been telling us, telling my mom. You know? And he now said, oh, guy is being beaten. There's blood all over his face. And I said, then what are you doing here? How can you leave him? He said, it was too much for him. He had to step aside. So I quickly ran, got to the commissioner of police, who took me to the government house, I met with the Milad, um, Dauda Musakomo, who quickly called the brigade commander at Bori Camp, and they, they assisted me with some security men to Gokana. I got to Gokana, and I saw young boys and girls, men and women, jubilating, chanting in our local dialect, we have killed the vultures. We have killed the vultures today. They were all chanting. Okotimo was not there. There was some, uh, some, I can't remember his name, that was in charge. And then what we did was to move towards the, the palace of the Gwenemene, which is the king of Gokana, where the meeting was being held. We got there, and I saw Alhaji Kobani, he's late now, and um, Chief Francis Pai in the shrine. Apparently, my own dad, he didn't believe in all those kind of things. He was running to the, to the Methodist church in Gokana to take refuge there when he was intercepted. A woman tried to put him in her house, her hut, to save him. But they quickly came there and threatened to kill the woman. And when he heard it, he stepped out. And then that's when he started receiving his beating. 
He was asthmatic. He tried to use his inhaler. No, they thought it was a, a device to get in touch with the police. And they beat him, butchered him. You understand? So now, when they got back to the palace with his lifeless body, are you getting what I'm saying? They got there. Actually, the butchering didn't take place there, but they had mutilated his body somehow. So when they got to the palace with his body down there, this was what I, the news I received from Alaji Kogani and uh, Chief Pai that I rescued. Chief Pai wasn't talking because he was on, like, unconscious. So Alaji Kogani was crying. And I now said, what happened? Where's my dad? And all that. He said, he's gone. He's dead. I said, where's his body? He said, they've taken it away. And he now said that when they brought my dad's body, Chief Ian Kobani was, you know, completely shattered. And a very courageous man. He got up and was shouting and all that and actually fought. Because at that state, he, at that stage, he knew he was going to die. And they beat him mercilessly. Put a rake right into his head. I don't think the family would like to hear further things that I heard there because it was nasty. I don't want to say that. They drove uh, 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 the head of the rake through his body into his stomach and he gave up the ghost. Now, while we were there, the army shot into the air to disperse the crowd. They moved some distance away. They were still chanting. At that point, that's how we now got Al Haji out. Then Okutimo and Senator Birabi arrived. And Okutimo told me and asked, what has happened? They said, so, so, so people have been killed, this have been killed, that have been killed. And Okutimo was so, was livid. He said, well, how can these people kill their own? What you I know? don't understand, um, and again, I can see the passion in, yes. in your voice. And yes. uh, I, you know, I, I do apologize for what you had and to And let me tell you witness. something. Sorry yes. to interrupt. I want to also let you know that the serving commissioner, which you were there for to celebrate, drove into the place. And he's one of the Ogoni Nine. And the question is, will the government pick one of their, their own that was in the cabinet and send him for trial just deliberately to, 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 to get him hanged? No. So the commissioner they the were there to celebrate drove, drove was one in. of the people who was executed by the government. Yes, he drove in and was busy chanting their slogans and went back home and never made a contact with the Milad or anybody to say such a thing was going on. So he was an insider, but with the government, but an insider with uh, those who perpetrated this crime. You understand? Mm. So your sense is that there is a colossal injustice that's been done to your father and the other three murdered Ogoni personalities and that Nigeria and the world are ignoring their side of the but story. But that's the truth. You know, the truth doesn't go out to propagate itself. In our, we have a, a platform where we have close to a million Ogonis in that platform. For the past two days, there have been war of words in that house over exoneration. And I think I have a very limited time here. We must talk about ex exoneration. Yes, I, I was going to get to that. And I, I should. I was going to get to that yes. because you are opposed to Ken Sarawiwa being exonerated, which is what his supporters are I'm calling for. Not just the one that is opposed to that. Half of Ogoni is opposed to that. Yeah, but we, we have you here, yes, so yes. we want to hear your, yes. your side of that. Yes, story. and this is the reason why we are opposed to it. He committed a crime. They are responsible for the murder of the four. So why do you exonerate them? And for instance, these people just thrive on lies and they, they have deep pockets. They just want to make money from the dead. I tell you what will happen if the president makes the mistake of it, granting that exoneration. They will move to the international courts to seek for compensation. And that will, in itself, granting that exoneration in itself is an admittance. It means the federal government has conceded that they killed the Ogoni Four. At that point, what do you expect the Four to do? And first of all, if that happens, that is the end of any form of reconciliation because half of Ogoni knows the truth. Like I was telling you, in that house, there were wars of war, war, um, uh, 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 words, we were warring ourselves 
in that house two days ago. There's probably a decision in Ugoni right now over exoneration. I personally, I thank the federal government. I thank the federal government for wanting to honor the Ogoni fallen heroes. There's nothing wrong with that. Because there's an underlining factor. Mm. Over the years, the government and Shell did nothing. If they did what was right, if Shell was not just making tiny roads that leads to their locations and neglecting the people, there won't be any reason for Mossop. And so, whether there are criminal elements in Mossop or not, all died for a cause. Mm. And so they need to be honored. That being said, it also means that, that doesn't mean that the criminal elements should be exonerated from what they did. Yes, that, that's understood. But beyond the fact, of course, that, I mean, because I, I, I'm wondering why the, um, the narrative seems to be in favor of Ken Sarawi. Yes, it's simply because, one, you know Ken was a writer. Yeah, he was famous. He had those connections when it comes to writing, and they have the money to continually propagate. We don't have that money. And yeah. of course, like I said earlier, uh, it, somebody threw, the, threw this point in the house yesterday, and he said, truth. And that is uh, something by Jonathan Swift. I said, lies, a lie will travel around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. Yeah, but, but let me ask and, you, you see, this. Let, let, me ask, is, let, let me say this. I mean, mm -hmm. you granted Ken Sarawiwa was a famous international writer. Mm -hmm. He was a television personality, um, you know, but he was fighting against a gross injustice against his people, which you have correctly identified here. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, their lands and their livelihoods had, all, had, had been all but destroyed. Is there a sense, uh, again, I'm wondering why that his narrative seems to supersede the other side. Is there a sense that perhaps General Abacha, who was a military dictator, and who was known to be a serial violator of the rule of law, was such a dark, sinister, and hated figure that he had to be wrong in the perception of most Nigerians and the international community. He had to be wrong to try Ken Sarawiwa in what many saw as a kangaroo military court, and very quickly after that sent him to the gallows. Well, what I have to say to this is that a military regime is always looked at in that way. Mm. And um, what is the difference when Sarawiwa as an environmental activist was authoritarian and wouldn't listen to other people's views? Yeah, but don't you, you, think, don't you think Ken Sarawiwa had a right of appeal? He didn't even get that right to appeal. I mean, in, in, a, in a court of law, in any system of... This was a military tribunal. Yeah, I mean, you understand? but, but Under he, he, military he should have had after, a right after of those, appeal. After the trial, I think the next step should be, in the military government, is the, the Supreme, Supreme Military, military Council. Council, where they deliberated on it and decided and took their decision. Right. Do you understand? But I tell you something, and I give you an account. Yesterday, in fact, mm. at about 7... 7.27, Ledo Mitter called me, and I'm so disappointed with him. He called me, and he told me, because of what was going on at our forum, and he said, please, calm down. I said, it's not my doing. He said, calm down. There's something in the offing. And I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, don't worry, I'll let you know after now. I'll be on air tomorrow. Why am I disappointed with him? You want me to calm down and not bring up the issues that are troubling Ogoni. Most of these people have rode on the wrongs of Ogoni people to fame, making money out of them, while the poor Ogoni people are out there suffering. Mm. And so he made me to believe that he was coming to put things together and that it was a mistake that they mentioned honoring the nine. It's going to be, he's going to mention it on TV tomorrow, 13. And I said, oh. you surreptitiously push to honor the nine, and then come on national television to say it's 13, and the federal government made a mistake. Well, there's nothing wrong you know? with him trying so, to correct something. Yeah, if, I know if, something is not wrong, would, but from you know, our own perspective, more this is the deceit we have been living right. with over the years. That's the point I'm trying to make. Right. So basically, from what I'm hearing from you, there is mm -hmm. still a yawning gap. Yeah. Gulf, basically, after almost 30 years between mm -hmm. the two sides 
Of course. Of a going that. And it's a divide that is still not being bridged, basically. Let me tell you, there are two communities in Goni that, has pro that produces most of the oil. My community and Bomu oil fields. Now, two of those brothers, Oragis, were killed from Bomu. My father and Kobani are from Bodo, they were killed. These are contiguous communities. You have Kedere community, where Mite is from, and then you have one in Eleme, Ibubu, Kurokoro in Thai, mm. and the Yola oil fields in Kana. Where we are going today, if we cannot, and I wish Ogoni can come back together as one, and that will start with a remorseful attitude from those who were responsible for the killings. Have you tried you to engage so, with them, or have they tried to reach out to you? We talk. I told you, we have a platform. If I expose that to the world, it's like washing our dirty linens in public. There's palpable tension in Ogoni. And that is why, in fact, I worked with President Tinubu as the Action Congress uh, Chairman in uh, River State, the defunct party, and uh, ACN. And I remember when we had crisis in River State. I remember Tinubu inviting me to his house in Bodilong through the chairman, Ajomale, Henry Ajomale, Chief Ajomale, and we had dinner together. We are students of Tinubu. His political philosophy, I believe in it. And he was actually, he's somebody who likes to get the background of a matter. And he asked me, what is going on in River State? When I told him, he suggested what we should do, and we ended the crisis. Do you understand? And that is why I'm here to give him a background. And I hope it gets to him, mm. because I don't have that access to reach him anymore. But, the, Today, the, but, but I mean, President Tinubu released a statement in honor of Ken Sarawiwa and the others. Um, you know, the Ogoni Nine. Yeah, the Ogoni Nine. And, and Sarawai, basically, part of the nine. Your, 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 I mean, your sense is that that's an admission that the that they killed them wrongfully in, a, in an act of judicial homicide. No, 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 no. Like I told you, there's an underlying uh, uh, fact that we must follow, that the government and Shell over the years created the situation for this agitation. Mm. So that is the remote cause. And so for that reason, whoever died in the course of this struggle, whether it was through criminality or not, need to be honored. And we need to thank him for that. I feel sorry for Sarawiwa. Because for me, he played himself into that because he should have just followed the, the initial president of Mosop, which is um, Garrick Leto, believed in the Gandhi model, passive resistance. He resigned because Sarua formed these militant wings. And he told him, I can't continue because you can't just be talking about nonviolence and then you send boys to blow up pipes everywhere and then you say, oh, the land is polluted. That was the kind of person Sarawiwa was. And that's the truth about right. him. Well, I don't have any evidence to yes. support the allegations that yes. you're making. But we, 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 the, we, we, we're coming to the dying moments of mm. the interview. What yeah. are you aiming to do now? Because the global and even the national narrative about what happened appears to be in favor of Ken Sarawiwa. I mean, he's seen as a martyr by many Nigerians. There's nothing wrong with that, it's a matter. When, even when somebody is negative in a revolution, uh, Gaddafi is a matter. Do you understand? They're all matters, whether positive or negatively, uh, in your, whether you're positive or negative in your attitude, mm. you're a matter. It was a revolution to bring about change in Ogoni. What I seek to address is a situation where you don't exonerate criminals. One of those on uh, in the Ogoni Nine. Most of them were not intellectuals there, except for the commissioner. Baribo Mbera, that's his name, was a talk, a known talk. And people should go out and investigate what I'm saying. I'm not just talking. It's not good to talk about the dead like this, because right. he has no right, to, he, he can't defend it, but this is the truth, it's right. the naked truth. Okay, well, before we go, just tell us a bit about your father, Mr. Albert Bade. I understand he was a former head of service and secretary to the government of River State. Yes, uh, before becoming secretary of government, he had been commissioner in several ministries, and um, he was a patriotic Ogoni son, so I will put because most of the things that happen in Ogoni today, the creation of the four local governments, we just had one local government. He facilitated that process to ensure that we have four local governments in Ogoni today. 
the only polytechnic high, the school of higher institution we have in Ogonela, and he put it in place. And so that was the kind of man he was. And um, he became uh, chairman of National Republican Convention. And of course, they used to call him Gentleman Buddy, all his friends, including Sarowiwa, who thanked him for all the good things he had done. I have that letter, unfortunately, it's not here, and said he was going to reciprocate. When he called my father a vulture in those days, my father called him and said, is this how you said you were going to reciprocate the good I did to you? He took that man's life, an innocent man. It's so sad. Well, I have to say that I'm very, very sorry for what happened to you, but I'm also very sorry for what happened to Ken Sarawiwa. I am deeply sorry for what is happening in Ogoni land. And I do hope that some form of restitution, some form of solution will be brought about in order to heal that, country, that land which has suffered a lot beyond losing its sons. I mean, it's also suffered unbelievable pollution and the ravages of its land. So we do hope that things will be resolved um, as soon as possible. But I, I want to thank you very much indeed One last for, for taking like the say. time yeah, briefly. Thank yes. Yeah, thank you. One last thing I would like to say is to call on the Nigerian press not to jump onto the bandwagon, to be able to also assist the process of disseminating the truth. It doesn't mean that if somebody is an environmental activist or a human rights crusader, he can't commit a crime. That is what he did, and used that as a smokescreen to advance his cause and uh, you know, to become famous. Well, you've and made we are that. still suffering from that you've made that till point. this moment. You've made that point. And I want to thank you very much indeed for coming in. Swage Bade is the son of Mr. Albert Bade, one of the Ogoni Four who was lynched by a mob in May 1994. Uh, Swage Bade himself is a businessman and former chairman of the AC and ACN in River State. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.